As I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, I recently moved from North Florida to South Florida, taking a new position at our regional seminary, where I'm a spiritual director and instructor. And if you have tidied a closet, a closet recently, or if you have moved, you know that it can be an interesting experience. You sometimes rediscover things like, oh, I didn't know I still had that. Or you can maybe find out, you know, where is that thing? I, I thought I had it in this closet, but it, it's not here anymore. Well, a friend of mine, uh, he's been married for several years, and he and his wife have moved several times. And one of the things that was a a sticking point between them was that she had several uh, language books, boxes of language books of the Chinese language, because one of her first jobs required her to know Chinese. But she hadn't had that job in years. And here he was, every time they moved, moving these boxes. So you know what he decided without telling her? That the last time they moved, He donated those books and then they moved again and guess what happened she goes hey um have you seen my boxes of language books and he's like well actually I I donated them you what you gave them away I wanted those he said I gave them away six years ago you haven't even noticed how much are you sure you really wanted them and valued them Well, it's an interesting contrast with our parables today about losing and finding, because what Jesus is telling us about how God looks upon us is that we are so significant. We are of the greatest value to God, and to be without us is a significant loss, and that God is immediately aware when we go away, will take action to find us and will persevere until we are found. Whenever Jesus gives us parables, they serve a twofold purpose. One purpose is to teach us something about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven that we are hoping to be in in its fullness one day. But the parables also teach us about here and now, what we are to do, how we are to live to be able to arrive at heaven. So what are two things that we learn? That our Father is love itself. Our Father loves us unconditionally. That is the good news. We are valued more than we can possibly imagine. But what does it mean for us here and now? It means, these parables tell us, that we must play an active role in this relationship. And especially when we identify a sin or we start to go away, we must take an active role to be found. Now, you may say, well, of course, Father Kevin, everyone knows that. And who would possibly refuse the invitation to be more deeply immersed in God's love and mercy? But I'll give you three reasons that may hit close to home. That we're blind, we fall into blame, or we're overwhelmed by shame. Let's look at blindness first. Consider the Pharisees. They were so comfortable living in their own interpretations of justice and mercy and did not believe they had any need for mercy. And because they were blind, they did not ask. And because they did not ask, they did not receive. But as we heard in our second reading, we cannot save ourselves by our own righteousness. We need a savior, each and every one of us. And that is the primary purpose why Jesus came to save everyone. And the second reason is that we fall into blaming. Well, if only other people or other things or other events hadn't gotten in my way, I would be a better disciple or I wouldn't be as in debt to God and to others. Maybe it's they, they're the ones that need to be reconciled, not me. And as long as I stay in that mindset, I won't participate in my own deepened conversion. Now, I don't know what thoughts the lost sheep had, but let's just use our imaginations. What if we could imagine what the lost sheep was thinking when he found out that he was lost? Might he have thought, well, if only the shepherd had spoken more loudly, then I would have heard him and stayed closer to him. If only the shepherd had walked slower, then I could have kept up with him. If only the path didn't have so many twists and turns and side paths, then I wouldn't have gotten lost. You see the pattern here? Maybe in light of our first reading from Exodus 32, if only Aaron and others hadn't created that idol, well, then I wouldn't have fallen into false worship. 
But what might blaming look like in our life? I invite us all just to consider our own story and our own hearts first and foremost. Well, if only the church had fewer hypocrites. If only my parents would have given me a better example. If only the priest preached better homilies. If only that traumatic event in my life hadn't happened. If only there had not been COVID. If only that other person hadn't led me into sin. Then I would be so much better off as a disciple of Jesus. I don't need to go to confession. There are worse sinners than me that need to go to confession first. You know, things do happen to us, and sometimes tragically, but those events don't have to define our life or our story. And we have to take an active role to make sure that God's mercy is defining of our story. There's a beloved priest in Florida, Monsignor Sipple, and he phrases it this way, that thing that happened to you, whatever that is, it may not be your fault, but it is your problem. Meaning, it happened and it's affecting me. It may not have been my fault, but I need to take an active role in managing it or resolving it and working with the help of God's grace. And then the third obstacle to receiving greater mercy is shame. That's when we run from the truth. We run from ourselves. Maybe others weren't at fault, but I definitely was not at fault. We deny our responsibility and we can't stand feeling like we've done something wrong. So we convince ourselves that we're completely innocent or that we are helpless to change our situation. I don't think the lost coin had any thoughts, but if it did, the lost coin might have given into the shame or helplessness thinking, well, I'm just a coin. I can't help being lost or found because I can only go where others take me and I can't help if they drop me and I roll under the dresser. I'm just a coin. I can't find my way back to the purse. I'll just wait here and be here until someone comes and gets me. I'm just a small coin. What am I in the big scheme of things? There are other lost items much more important than me that that deserve the attention of God and others. So what might this sound like in our life, in our own thoughts? Well, if God really wants me, If he wants me to be more deeply converted, then he's going to have to come and find me. And unless he sends an angel or a lightning bolt, I'm just going to keep on my merry way, doing what I'm doing and trusting that that's good enough for God. I don't need to change. Or it could be, well, I don't need to repent now. I'll repent some other day down the road. Or maybe we think, I'm just helpless. There's nothing I can do to make things right. Or even worse, there's no hope for me. I must have never been meant to live an extraordinary life or to become a saint. In the book, Crucial Conversations, the authors of the book point out that we often tell ourselves three stories. They call them clever stories because what they all have in common is they take the responsibility to act away from us and put it on others. And there are stories where you focus on another as the villain, myself as the victim, or just being completely helpless. You see what we've already shown in the parables so far? We can tell ourselves these very stories. I did nothing wrong. I'm just being punished or persecuted, and there's nothing I can do about it. The authors warn us of making the fool's choice That's the all or nothing, the either or. Either I've done nothing wrong or my sins are too great to deal with. But there is a middle way. It's a narrow and difficult way, but St. Paul found it. And that's what we heard in our second reading. He realizes that, yes, he was a great sinner, but God had mercy upon him and called him to be an apostle, welcomed him into salvation. He was able to acknowledge the fullness of his fault because he believed that God's mercy was greater. When we look at the prodigal son, I'm sure that both sons, the older and the younger, were telling themselves some pretty clever stories to rationalize their pursuit of pleasure, but also rationalize their resentment. 
But let's see what we can learn about their role in the story and consider for ourselves. The younger son definitely played a role in his own going away from the father and his misfortune. But he also played a direct role in his return as he came back, maybe not even with the most pure motives or perfect contrition, but he came back nonetheless. The older son definitely definitely played a role in his own passive aggression and resentment and judgment of the father, ruminating over those thoughts. And, and he has yet to recognize his part. He is still resentful and now even angry that the father is welcoming back the younger brother. But let's look at the father and remember that this is our heavenly father. He loves both his sons, yet he offers his love as a free gift that can either be re- accepted or rejected. Because for love to be true, it must be free. The father is grieved at the distance between him and his sons, and he waits eagerly to be reconciled and to celebrate even more than if they had never sinned. The parables teach us that God's actions are unchanging, but we are called to change. We are called to change our dispositions toward God, to repent, to be more deeply converted from our sins, great or small. And some people call this self-leadership. Self-leadership begins with the awareness. This is kind of funny if you think about it. We have all played a role directly in all of our bad decisions. It's true. We were there for 100% of them. We've played a direct role in every one of our sins. But here's the good news. It goes the other way, too we can all play a direct role in our own deepened conversion and reconciliation. Just as we have been part of the problem, we must be part of the solution. So this is really about personal accountability to these truths and to first and foremost lead ourselves cooperating with God's grace. So what are three resolutions we can make to lead ourselves back to the Father? Number one is to make a commitment to ourselves. I will not lie to myself even when being honest makes me feel bad or guilty about myself. We can't lead ourselves when we're not being honest, and we can be our own best deceivers. We must ask ourselves, what do I really want? And is what I'm doing according to what I really want? So this brings us to our second commitment, that I will prioritize what I value most, over what I want right now. That's putting the ultimate goals and values of your life over today's satisfaction. Rarely is what we want today consistent with deeper, more meaningful, long, longer lasting goals. And here's the thing, you may say, well, I don't really know what I, what I value most. But I can tell you, I can promise you, you know when you will figure that out? On or right before your funeral. That's when everyone will come to know what they valued most. When they're looking back at their life and it's already been lived, we will realize that we either did live according to our convictions and our beliefs, or we did not. So the the author Stephen Covey in The Seven, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People says, so begin this day, begin the rest of your journey with the end in mind. Look forward to that. Ask yourself, What do I want to be able to say genuinely about the way that I lived? Not my intentions, but my actions. Or you can ask yourself, what do I want my spouse, my family, my children, my loved ones and friends, what do I want them to be able to honestly say, not just the nice things that we say when someone passes, but truly and honestly, what do I want them to say about how I lived? Take a few moments and ask yourself those questions and write it down. I did this yesterday morning to refresh that practice. So I try to practice what I preach before I'm asking you to do it. And it is, it's very fruitful. I think the Holy Spirit is working with our heart and our mind as we write those things down to really hear what we value most. But you may say, Father, I don't know, that just sounds kind of sad, kind of morbid. I I don't know if I'd feel comfortable thinking about the fact that I'm going to die one day and, and what I might be thinking then. But consider the alternative. It may seem sad or depressing to consider that reality, but you know what's more depressing and even more sad? Is living the rest of your life without your priorities 
and then you find out what they are when it's too late to live according to them. That is the greatest of sadnesses and tragedies. The third and final commitment we can make to ourselves is, I will not attempt to lead myself by myself. We can't do this alone. That's why we use an examination of conscience to prepare for the sacrament of reconciliation, to see the things that we can't see ourselves just by going on our memory. It also means that I need to surround myself with and invest most in the relationships of those people around me who share my values and will support me in them. But if I only surround myself with people who share today's satisfaction and and my interest today, they might very well lead me away from what I value most. And I'm grateful for that summary of self-leadership from uh, Andy Stanley in one of his um, podcasts. So as we come back to ourselves today, where do we need to look for how we are blind or given to willful blame and shame? Are we telling ourselves others and God clever stories where others are the villain and we are the helpless victim? Can I resolve to take the steps I need to cooperate with God's grace and lead myself back from being lost, even to any degree, to being found, to being more deeply converted? Can I commit to being honest with myself, to prioritizing my values and to live by them, and to invest more in the relationships where people will support me in my values. I've heard it said, God created you without you, but God cannot save you without you. We must play an active role in our own sanctity. Even if we were to find ourselves dead in our sins like the prodigal son, we can come back to life. We can be restored to our baptismal dignity as sons and daughters and heirs to the heavenly kingdom and the sacrament of reconciliation, which the catechism also describes as the sacrament of resurrection. It restores us, restores us to spiritual life. But we must be humble enough to acknowledge our, our failure and trusting enough that God's mercy is greater than anything I have done or have failed to do.